Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this presentation. My name is Simone Sorini and by my side Claudia Viviani, we are Italians. We are performers and researchers of early Italian music, medieval and renaissance. We are honored to be here, this is a perfect place for a project like ours. In fact, this project researches the connection between arts, poetry, paintings and, of course, music. Many don't know that uh, the greatest masters of Renaissance paintings were also poets. In many cases, they were poets of a high level. And if we take, for example, the trio, the three great Italians, Leonardo, Michelangelo and Raphael, we can without doubt establish that they were all three poets, all three were poets. In the case of Leonardo and Raphael, they were only amateurs. They didn't write a lot of poets. But if we take Michelangelo, he was kind of a professional one. He wrote an entire canzoniere, we would call it in Italy, an entire book of poems. And his poems were very deep, profound, and very elaborate. He was a professional poet. And not only these great masters, these famous masters that I've mentioned, but also some minors, if we can use the word minor for Benvenuto Cellini, the great sculptor from Florence, or Donato Bramante, the architect and painter and musician from Italy who invented the Renaissance Romans. So uh, it was also in use in those times, and we are talking about the early 1500s, it was also in use to have. Uh, to, to write poems about paintings, about famous paintings of the times. This is the case, for example, of the Lady with the Ermine. You probably know this magnificent portrait by Leonardo, the Lady with the White Animal, Ermine. There is a poem, a sonnet, that a uh, Florentine poet wrote this sonnet about this painting, and it describes the painting in every detail. So, in case we lose the portrait, we have a sonnet describing it, and we have many in Italy many sonnets about the famous painting. But since our intention is to put music, as you see, youth, to put music to this very particular kind of poetry, the poetry of the master's painters, so how can we do that? Seeing as these painters were not composers themselves, they were not musicians, they were, they were performers. In many cases they were singers or instrumentalists. And in the case of Leonardo, he was also an instrument maker. Yeah. He did build some instruments, or at least he projected some. He drew some strange, weird instruments. But they were not composers, they didn't left any music, they didn't write music. So how can we do that? We have to know that in those days, in the past, the poet and the musician were two faces of the same coin. In fact, one wasn't a poet without also being a musician, or a musician without being a poet. It was just two faces of the same coin. In fact, this, we are talking about the golden age of the singing lutenists. We have one here, we have another, another one here. The singing lutenists, we call them in Italy, in Italian, the cantori al liuto, which is the exact translation. This is a liuto, and this is a cantore, and I am also a cantore. So, they use the lute, this instrument, uh, for reciting their poetry. Why did they choose a string instrument? For many reasons. It, uh, it was able to give a rhythmic support to the singing of poetry and the melodic support. So the poetry became music, became singing. And it was normal in the past. It was always like this. Poetry was music, was singing. So a few words about this instrument and this instrument, which is the same, the same model, almost the same. It has basically three parts. The belly, which is this resounding space, the belly. It's, it's made out of wood. Everything is wood here. There's no metal inside, not inside nor outside. And this wood is particular because this wood comes from a painting and this is another connection between paintings and music. We can rebuild instruments only by looking at paintings. So this is why this is an important connection. And this wood comes in particular from a famous painting you are all lovers of art, as I suppose, so you probably know this painting by Hans Holbein, The Ambassadors. So where you have the two Italian ambassadors, and it was painted in Venice, if I remember well. And between the two, there is a table with uh, mathematical, astronomical instruments and 
there is also a lute in this position. So this instrument has been rebuilt from that particular painting. And it has the same woods, because you can recognize this particular wood, which is bird eye maple, very rare at the moment, and apparently it gives the same sound of the lute of this epoch. So same, same woods, same measures, same everything. Then we have the resounding table, the sound table, very important because of the sound. The rows, and of course you have the strings, the neck. The neck has a fretboard, which is almost the same fretboard as a modern guitar. Only difference is the frets are movable because of the tuning. You can tune, you can make very fine tuning with movable frets here. And the pegs. The number of the strings was fixed in 11 for those times. But it was not always like this, because here I have 11 pegs, but I don't have 11 strings, because it was a choice of the performer whether if you wanted to be to have double strings, for example I have double in the bass, but I don't have double, I have, I have single strings in the high, in the high strings. So it was, it was a choice. Anyway. This instrument came in Europe, it was imported by Arab nations, they still have the oud, which is the traditional instrument of Arab nations, and the lute comes directly from the lute, which himself is, as its origins, in ancient Egypt, so when it was a ceremonial instrument. So we have said a few words on the lute. So they used this instrument to sing poetry. It, this was the instrument of singing poets. But where can we find today the repertoire? of this man, of this musician, because as they were improvisers, they didn't left any music, they were not able to write music. So, apparently, all their repertoire as this film is lost. Uh, but if we look carefully at some primitive music of the, of the early 15th century, then we find some interesting things. Not everything is lost, in fact. Uh, we can rebuild, or we can at least try to rebuild their repertoire and, most important, their vocal style from some of these scores. And let me introduce the figure of Ottaviano Petrucci. Ottaviano Petrucci from Italy. He was not a painter, he was not a poet, he was not even a musician. But he was a printer. He was a very important printer and he made very, very important invention for the times. He invented the block letters for music. So you know, the, the great invention of Gutenberg. This is the same, of the same import, equal importance because it revolutioned, absolutely revolutioned the world of music, as you can imagine. Because after that invention, with that invention, printers were able to print any kind of music. They printed hundreds, thousands of books of music. And this is why, still today, we have a lot of music of these times. This was only thanks to the Petrucci invention. So it was block letters for music. Imagine, they, they were able to move notes instead of letters, so they, they were able to combine any kind of line of music. So in some of the first 11 books, which are very much important, and they are historical, first 11 books of Ottaviano Petrucci, printed by Ottaviano Petrucci, we find some scores, some songs, which are not accompanied by lyrics. So what does it mean? The normal thing was to find a score with three, four or more lines. The first one was always vocal line for the singer, and underneath the music, the notes, you would find always the lyrics, the text, that goes together with the music and the other lines could be instrument, but always if it, if, it, if it was sung music, then you had to have the lyrics, of course. In this course, you don't have the lyrics. So what does it mean? It is Petrucci who tells us directly what, what was it for. It was to, to sing on that music any kind of poetry, even your own, that's what he says. You, can, you could sing even your own poetry, your own verses on that music. So it was a kind of um, examples, samples, for improvisation. He wanted to give some samples to the poets, not to the musicians, to the poets, for making their own music on their own lyrics. That's quite an interesting thing. 
very interesting discovery. Not, not a lot of consideration was given to modern performance, to modern performance to this, uh, to this course because they were always considered as incomplete or some kind of experiments. But uh, so uh, this music was never performed until now. It lays there in those eleven books because it was considered, as I said, incomplete, so not very much interesting. But I found it very, very, very interesting. Some farther enriched uh, passages uh, through the embellishment of singing melody allows us to understand the vocal formation of the vocal styles of the cantorial lute of the 1500s. So a very, very important discovery. Through that we can, in some way, rebuild a style which is apparently lost. And this is how we can, of course, listen today to the music and to the poetry in music of the great painters of the Renaissance that were, who were cantorial youth themselves, improvisers and musicians. So our uh, intention is to record a CD on that project, finding all the lyrics, all the poems by the great painters, not only Italian, but I would say mostly Italian. All the great Italians were also poets and singers and instrumentalists. So our intention is to record the CD and we hope we will have the occasion to present it here next year when we will be ready because it's a lot of work as you can imagine. And maybe to have also a concert here, so maybe we will have the occasion to meet again. For the moment we will let you hear a song from this repertoire. Um, this song, these lyrics are by Michelangelo. You all know Michelangelo. And, uh, but few know that he was also a great poet. And as I said, his poetry was very dark, very dark and obscure. Even for us Italians, it's very difficult to understand what these poems are about. The only thing one can say is that this particular song is about love and death. That's what I can understand, not more than that. Yeah. 